It's crazy how I know about all this occult stuff that you're talking about. So I've I've done sensory deprivation. It's one of the things I do, but I've never heard about. I, I know that they do the rooms where it's so quiet it drives you insane because you can hear your organs and everything right. moving. Yeah. So that's so imagine being in a sensory deprivation room or an anechoic room and going from that experience from one extreme to the next experience of suddenly you're listening to sounds, frequencies, tones, lights flashing in your mm -hmm. face, images flashing, right? They would do like the one extreme to the next. Um, dark retreats are this new trend where people go and like what Jay said, he puts himself in there for three days. Some people go on dark retreats for just a couple of days and others go for weeks or months and they don't see any light at all. And you, what your mind does, like everything changes in terms of like your consciousness and whatnot, but you know, there's no external light. And there's this idea that we need lights to see color, but I don't know about you. Like I see some of the most fantastic color just with my eyes closed. There's a guy that I used to watch on YouTube. He's like a meditator guy. Like he used to be really big into psychedelics. And then he moved into more just like Buddhism and meditation. But he would talk about taking golf balls, not golf balls, ping pong balls, ping pong balls, cutting them in half, painting the inside of the ping pong ball black and then strapping it around and tight enough so that no light comes in. And he swears to this day that you will never have more intense hallucinations than that. So where is the light coming from, right? You, like if, if you need light to see color, there's also like, you can look at your screen in light mode or dark mode. Are you familiar with that? Like there's also light mode and dark mode in your mm -hmm. inner vision, right? We talk about this sometimes with, um, you know, when we do psychedelics, like for, for me, most of the time it's in dark mode. So I'm seeing all of these very vivid colors on a background of black. So it's like, I'm seeing the full light spectrum and sometimes it's very bright and very saturated, but it's coming like from a dark base. Every once in a while, I will have an experience that I haven't been able to figure out what the mechanism is that makes it different, where everything is white behind it, and then the colors emanate from the white end of the light spectrum. And I might see similar or even, quote, the same colors, but they feel different because of what their background is, or what it's coming, right? For her, it's opposite. For her, she most of the time sees it coming from from the white and, and, but she's had a few occasions with the black, right? So these are different ways of experiencing color and light spectrum and optics. And then the information or the frequencies sort of associated with it. And then also in those dark rooms, particularly if they're small, if you're in a movie theater or even an anechoic chamber, if it's not super tiny, it's less womb-like, but if you're in a coffin, it's a pretty tight space, right? Um, sound in there, Right. Like, I don't know. I, you know, there's less information out there about like light in there, but we always hear about like, oh, people playing classical music for their babies or, you know, stuff like that. But if you listen to what it sounds like inside of a womb, like for a baby to hear like the mother's heartbeat and the organs working, because you were talking about hearing your organs, it sounds like certain kinds of music. Like, it really, that's part of what I like about techno is it has that. <laughs> That's like a heartbeat kind of thing, right? And you're just right there inside of it. That's kind of an anechoic chamber of its own. Um, and then there was uh, one more thing you said. Oh, let's go to the East. Oh, uh, what does this say? Ooh. Magical. You said something about magical. I can't read my own writing. Mm -hmm. well, exercise. Magical exercises. Yes, magical exercises, right? So I... Uh, I think of, of dancing as a magical exercise. I was interviewing someone last night who was in the Carlos Castaneda cult and they used to do what they called uh, magical passes, right? Which is very similar to like dance, like certain kinds of like uh, popping. If you know what mudras are, if you watch like mm -hmm. any of the moves in uh, OA or something like that, right? That's very similar to certain kinds of dancing, popping, tutting, voguing, things like that. And this can be used to open doorways and dimensions and play with light and angles and different kinds of things as well. So you brought that up. Was that an interview or was that just a. Yeah, it was an interview. It's not, I just did it last night. I have a bunch of stuff in the can. 
Damn, that's gonna be fire. I, would, I really want to listen to that one because that 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 whole <laughs> that whole story is crazy. <laughs> so too, she's done a lot of other shows about the Carlos Castaneda cult, and we were kind of all we were excited to talk to each other. Like we could have probably talked for five hours. We don't three and a half hours, and it was kind of all over the place. It wasn't like as focused in as like sometimes I like to be. I'm sure we'll do other shows. Uh, I think it's one of the most, I don't think it's been paid enough attention to the Carlos Castaneda cult in comparison to all the other MK people and leaders and doctors and cults and whatever. So we did talk a little bit about that, but the magical passes and the movements are sort of like these magical exercises that you are talking about. And when I would, when I would go to parties and I, I don't go as much anymore because there's just not ones I like, but there I am in a black box in an anechoic chamber with sound and light and doing these moves, these magical exercises and having these dimensional and temporal distortive experiences that I, you know, I found to be interesting. Like I'm not put off by that. Like to me, like the weirder, you know, the better. Um, and then I just want to hit on this Easter egg thing because Laura looked it up for me. She brought up two things. So there's something called the Easter egg in media. I haven't read this yet, so I'm just reading it to you. So if it's a, if it's a dud, it's a dud. The, an Easter egg is a message, image, or feature hidden in software, a video game, a film, or another, usually electronic medium. So I was right. that, that That's what I was thinking of, right? The term used in this manner was coined in 1979 by Steve Wright, the then director of software development in the Atari Consu uh, Consumer Division, to describe a hidden message in the Atari video game adventure in reference to an Easter egg hunt. The earliest known video game Easter egg is in Moonlander, in which the player tries to land a lunar module on the moon. If the player opts to fly the module horizontally through several of the game screens, they encounter a McDonald's restaurant, and if they land next to it, the astronaut will visit it instead of standing next to the ship. The earliest known Easter egg in software in general is one placed in the make command for PDP-6, PDP-10 computers sometime in 1967-68, wherein if the user attempts to create a file named love by typing make love, the program responds not war. So it's a hidden message. It's cryptography, basically, uh, the Easter egg. And then what was the other thing you sent? Did you email it or did you still have it open? You emailed it to me. There looked like there was something from some sort of wartime operation in relation to. Yeah, it's called Operation Easter egg. There's, there's a, okay. So let's see. She'll bring it's it back. A German thing. And I'll open it. German. So. This one. There you go. It's going to be that. Okay. So Operation Easter Egg was the German plan for sabotage of depots. O only the over, let's see. In 1943, the imaginative German intelligence service concocted Operation Easter Egg, an undertaking designed to establish small hidden depots of explosives and incendiaries in numerous caches or caches strategically located in France, Holland, Belgium, and Western Germany. The German intelligence service intended to utilize these depots to supply German agents and native traders. The mission of these saboteurs was to disrupt allied rear communications after a German army withdrawal from the area, thus aiding the German forces to recapture the lost territory. So it's basically about sabotage. Um, but it, there's a lot of information here about how you plot and plan the sort of Operation Easter Egg. It's kind of interesting. It's a pretty long article that we don't have time to. Oh, but what's interesting here is they have a box that looks like an anechoic chamber that they stored some of this stuff in. <laughs> so we've always, right, the Matrix, we have the white rabbit, Alice in Wonderland. You have the yeah. rabbit with the time, with the, he's always in a hurry to fight, yeah. to, to, he's late to something. So we have this alchemical plate here, one of my favorites as well. And it's kind of sort of hinting at, right, you follow the white rabbit, you're blindfolded, the alchemist is led into the, into the rabbit hole. So the whole Easter egg, I think, is pertains to this. But this idea here that the tomb of Christian Rosencruz is at the center of this mountain, at the center of this, uh, of the world, whatever it is, Again, these are the different levels of the alchemical process, the different levels of ascension, the different levels of 
transformation, whatever it is that you want to consider it as. But it just when I when it, when I think of rabbits, I think of this alchemical plate immediately. Now, 